Laura Van Holstein, thank you so much for coming on to Evolution Soup from your home in Cambridge, United Kingdom. You are a PhD candidate studying evolutionary biology and anthropology at the University of Cambridge, and just last month, March 2020, you published your revolutionary research into the role of subspecies in evolution. How have you been doing, Laura, since the news of your discovery hit the headlines? You uh, must be getting a lot of attention and messages about your work and how, uh, as the press have put it, you've proved one of Darwin's evolutionary theories. Yeah, that's right, Mark. Um, well, first of all, thank you for having me on. Um, yeah, so that's right. So, so um, we published the research last month, and that kind of coincided with you know the social isolation and the lockdown happening in the UK. And weirdly, for me, like you kind of uh, anticipated, I feel like my, my social life, especially with people I don't know, has kind of um, you know, exploded. Um, so, so rather than being very isolated, I've been talking to people a lot. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, I, did, I, have, I have received some, some strange um, messages. So people, people, it kind of falls into a few categories. So we have the people that, that well, are very angry that, that I'm doing you know, evolutionary biology, and um, it's, it's nothing against me personally, it's just the fact that I study evolution because evolution doesn't happen or it's wrong. So it's messages oh, like that, you know, where they try and educate, or they want to educate me on evolutionary biology. And, uh, and then some people are very angry that I've said that humans, so we don't have subspecies, uh, and I get. I think we'll 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 get into that a little bit um, later on in the show because um, it's mm. a good question. People are very uh, keen on the idea of us having uh, subspecies, and then there are some really weird people that that have insinuated all kinds of things about why I am where I am. I basically don't do the work. Is what they insinuate, and that's 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 bizarre. I mean, they, you know, they actually. It's very strange. To, yeah, yeah, it feels it feels weird. But yeah, so but also lots of lots of uh, interest uh, in the methods, um, in the implications, that kind of thing. So also nice interest. <laughs> so it's not been all bad. Um, yeah, and then and then you say uh, correctly that the press have said that I've proven one of Darwin's theories, and um, you know I have to kind of you know be the killjoy and the party pooper in this and say that you know if if you're if you're doing science in a in a way that I guess is. Um, accepted is uh, you can't really prove anything per se. It's more you give enough evidence um, to yeah. suggest that something is uh, correct or the case. Um, so that's that's essentially what uh, what we did in that publication is to is to give evidence for something that Darwin um, predicted. Okay, we're going to be talking about a lot of fascinating things in this interview. But before we begin, can you just tell us a little bit about your background? Uh, I was born in Holland, but I've kind of lived all over the place. And I did my um, undergrad degree uh, at Cambridge. And the degree itself was very broad. It was called um, Human, Social and Political Sciences. And I basically, I mean, in my personal statement, because you know in the UK you have to write your personal statement, uh, I basically said that I just couldn't choose uh, what I found interesting. So I just wanted to, you know, go into the, the broadest course possible, basically. So that was uh, Human, Social and, Politi uh, and Political Sciences. And then I specialised pretty much after my, my first year already. Um, I decided that, that uh, biological anthropology uh, was a thing that, that that actually really grabbed my attention because it was still very broad, um, but it was kind of looking mm. at humanity from a biological perspective. There's lots of different perspectives you can take, um, but that was the thing that, that sort of resonated with me most. So I, I um, ended up specializing in um, biological anthropology or bioanth, as I'll probably end up calling it um, during this interview. Um, right. And then after my uh, undergrad degree, um, I basically did field work in uh, Kenya for a, for a while um, as part of the wow. um, in Africa project. Yeah, that was that was. I mean, because I was really used to you know the kind of sitting behind your desk reading thousands of papers and kind of drowning in words, and then suddenly you're taken out of that you know the, the sort of ivory tower, and then you're taken into um, uh, the northern Kenyan desert to actually look for these things, and that that was um, really cool. Um, and then I like in the footsteps worked... of the leakies and everything. Yeah, yeah, and actually, I, I did meet the leakies, and you know, we work at their um, at their institute, TBI, uh, the Takana Basin Institute. Um, so uh, yeah, a lot of 
the stuff that that um, is found as part of the in Africa uh, project is is um, kept in TBI. Um, yeah, so um, that was that was a crazy world and and, and a brilliant uh, experience. And then I um, worked uh, in a medical consultancy for a while, did an internship. So that was kind of a comp again a completely different side of science and applying it to uh, to the medical side of things and, and more especially the, the kind of you know medical policy and that kind of thing. And then I started my um, PhD, which I'm I want to say in the process of completing, but. <laughs> It's always a it's <laughs> it's a long process, put it that way. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm in my third year now. Right. I think the best place to start is to ask what exactly is meant by a subspecies. Yeah, that's that's a very good question. Um, so when I when I talk about my research, people are always you know they're like, oh, that's interesting, and then they think about it more. Uh, and people that know about um, issues with species definitions are like, well how okay if we can't even say what a species is how on earth are you going to tell me what a subspecies is and the thing is subspecies are actually better defined than uh, species i would say um so we have i think it's like 30 definitions of species and only one functional definition of subspecies so subspecies essentially um means that you've got a population that represents a break from everything else you see in the species and it has to represent a break in three ways. So the first is it has to have its own range. It's distinct, um, usually a breeding range. Um, and then it has to represent um, a break in phenotype. Um, and that, that sounds like a really vague thing, but there's actually uh, published rules about um, you know, how much difference you should expect uh, to see. So basically uh, that rule is called the 75% rule. And what you want is 75% of the members of your proposed subspecies cannot mm -hmm. overlap phenotypically with 99% of the rest of the species. So of course you still have a and tiny for anyone who doesn't know, a phenotype is? Basically what you look like, the, the, your, your external yeah. characteristics. Um, yeah. So basically what that means is, is it has to actually represent a distinct unit uh, within the species. And then genetically, it's a little bit more uh, complicated, um, but you don't want um, the subspecies to be completely reproductively isolated from the rest of the species because by then, and what I mean by that is, you know, they never interbreed um, because by then what you've basically got is a separate species. It's a new species, yeah. That's right, yeah, a new species. Um, so to, to give some examples, um, I, I actually have um, a book next to me. With, this is probably my favorite book, actually, apart from like, um, you know, Lord of the Rings, but <laughs> um, where I have some examples. Oh, yeah, so this is, this is um, by Jonathan Kingdon, and it's uh, his field guide to African mammals. So there's some really nice examples if people are interested, um, because what he does is oh. a lot of the time he draws very clearly what the differences are between varieties or subspecies. So I thought I'd give some examples. Um, so first, of course, you've got the, um, the chimpanzees, um, and you can contrast them with the bonobos. So they're both members of the same genus, Pan, uh, but mm -hmm. chimpanzees have four subspecies, um, and uh, bonobos have no subspecies. You know, Kingdon sort of describes what, what the differences are between uh, the subspecies, but um, what you'll see on, on the screen is that they have their own separate ranges, um, and then Kingdon goes into some detail describing the differences. So you've got things like uh, the, the various subspecies has a, a dark face, uh, but then a, a light muzzle, um, and they're bearded. Uh, and then you've got trog pan troglodytes, troglodytes, uh, which is very pale, has a freckled face and darkens with age, you know, these kinds of differences. So they're phenotypically distinct from each other um, and they have their own range. And then we get to my favorite uh, group of uh, monkeys, um, just because they really lend themselves to painting. They're very uh, photogenic. <laughs> so it's the Cercopithecus <laughs> monkeys. <laughs> um, and Kingdom has a nice illustration of the, uh, the lesser spot-nosed monkey. Um, which has two mm -hmm. subspecies, and again, they have their own uh, ranges. Um, and the, the main differences, and you can see that very clearly, are in the face. Uh, so the, I find this very difficult to pronounce, but the Butacophory <laughs> subspecies um, basically has brown spots uh, on its uh, face, and the other subspecies mm -hmm. just doesn't have that. Um, and you can also see in the pictures that the sort of the shape of the uh, the coloration is different as well. Um, right. I guess we'll move on to, uh, what else did I want to show? Oh yeah, they're very cute. Uh, Ogilby's uh, Dauker. I say that with a Dutch accent, but I think it's Dauker, also in English. Um, 
but yeah, basically I've you've got... I've spoken to a lot of scientists and they don't know how yeah. to pronounce oh, a lot good. of these binomial names at all. <laughs> good, because I, I have no idea. Um, so sorry to the doubters, but um, yeah, so there's three subspecies in this species um, and they look very distinct. So they have very different coloration, different, um, mm -hmm. um, especially um, uh, on the face. Uh, and again, they have their own uh, distinct um, ranges. Uh, Kingdon makes the point that they could be considered uh, species, so we need to look at uh, the genetics of these. And that, I think, illustrates the point really well uh, that I make in the paper, that subspecies um, can become species over time. And that's what we sort of give evidence for. And that's kind of what, you know, this Dauker uh, example illustrates, mm. that you get this regional diversification, and then if that persists for long enough, they could, over time, um, become species. And of course we've got the tigers as well, um, which are very topical at the moment, tiger subspecies. Um, oh, yeah. but, <laughs> but in existence, uh, today we've got six uh, tiger subspecies. It used to be nine, but uh, three have gone extinct. Um, and so you've got the people with the mullets um, saying, <laughs> Um, <laughs> saying that we can just, you know, to, because they're really, really endangered, we can, inter, you know, we can breed them all together and that'll increase genetic diversity. We can just release them into the wild um, and that'll save the species. And actually, that just makes no sense when you look at the genetic data, but also when you look at their phenotypes. And, you know, you, you get everything from the, uh, I think it's called the Amur, Amur um, uh, subspecies, which, you know, lives in, in the north, um, and it's huge. I think it's uh, on average there's something the males are something like 170 kilos, um, and uh, they have very thick um, uh, coats. Um, that they're much lighter on average because you know they're in uh, more snowy environments. And then contrast yeah. that with the um, Sumatran uh, tiger, and they're tiny. Well, okay, 100 kilos on average the yeah, males. That's, that's a big yeah. difference. Um, <laughs> so that's like you know an adult human male, I guess. That's that's their kind of um, weight. Uh, and they have very, uh, their, their stripes are very close together and, and their um, coats are very thin. So they're adapted to their own um, environment. And, you know, there have been studies um, distinctively showing that these are six independent uh, or, or yeah, units uh, of conservation concern. Um, and so what you're doing when you're breeding all of these subspecies together and just creating generic tigers is you're getting rid of all of that um, uh, local adaptation that subspecies represent. And if you then release that into the wild, you're probably going to cause a situation mm -hmm. in which those locally adapted subspecies are outcompeted because you've just suddenly put loads of um, generic ones in. We don't even really know much about some of these subspecies. And they themselves will go extinct and be outcompeted by. So it's it's yeah. Don't believe the people with the mullets. <laughs> what, what, what you're saying is is that uh, when when uh, a group becomes a subspecies, it's it's already got as it were the mechanism to speciate into something new. But mm. if you mess around with it, like you're describing, it sort of like stymies that. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So basically, what you're seeing is with subspecies is adaptation to uh, local environments. Um, and, and that kind of is a very typical, you know, if there's barriers, if, if barriers form between those subspecies or if they just remain um, isolated for long enough, you've got the, the archetypical case of allopatric speciation, which is where uh, you've got a barrier between what used to be um, populations of the same species um, and they you know, adapt to their own environment um, and become future species. Um, yeah, so you're right. And I think you mentioned giraffes as well, the spots yeah, on them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So um, giraffe spots. Um, so you've got um, four species of giraffes, I think, and then um, two of those uh, four species have subspecies. The other two um, don't have any subspecies. Um, one of them has three subspecies, the other has two, um, and they all have very distinct uh, coat patterns. Um, yeah. Mm. Well, the story of your discovery begins when you were studying for your BA in biological anthropology a few years ago. Your dissertation focused on the archaic humans known as the Denisovans, as well as the mysterious ghost hominin species that their DNA tells us they'd interbred with. Can you uh, tell us about that? Uh, I've had a few questions like this uh, in recent times, and I kind of forgot that I did this because <laughs> all of my work now has, you know, been been very much on the side of mammals and looking at mammal diversification and stuff. And I kind of forgot that I also did stuff um, with genetics, but that was my obsession 
for Ooh. a while uh, in my third year. Um, so now I'm more proud that I, when I look back and, and read what I've actually done, um, I'm more proud of it now than I was then. Um, but yeah, so basically what I did was um, I looked at, um, oh, to give some context, the Denisovans are a, um, a sister species to Neanderthals. Um, so those two species are more closely related to each other than they are to humans, but we are all very closely related. Um, and basically, if you look at its DNA, it's a bit weird. Um, so I kind of did a weird, you know, little um, investigation, I guess, into um, what was it doing? Uh, because what is mm. weird about its DNA is that it looks like, it, well, basically, um, you'd expect the Denisovan genome and the Neanderthal genome to have roughly equal amounts of divergence, the difference. Um, to the human genome because they've shared um, a common ancestor um, and then they diverge from each other, but they share a common ancestor uh, with humans. Anyway, you'd expect them to have um, the, roughly the same amount of differences with the, yeah. um, the modern human genome, um, and they don't, and that's weird. Um, and so what I did in that uh, dissertation was I looked at the Denisovan genome specifically because it has more differences than you'd expect. And so what I did was I, I isolated those bits of the genome that are very, very different um, and mm -hmm. then looked at, you know, what could what genes do you find in those areas? So what could the sort of functional um, consequences have been of these differences? And then the hypothesis was that those differences were the product of uh, interbreeding with something that that we don't know much about. So not Neanderthal and not human, um, something else. So like you say, a ghost um, hominin. That's the, uh, right. that was the project. Well, it was during your PhD that you became more and more intrigued by the natural processes that created diversity within mammals and more specifically, how a subspecies may eventually become a totally new species. Laura, take us to that eureka moment when it hit you that the relationship between animal species and their subspecies was the key to understanding how evolution works. It's not an entirely new idea. Uh, in fact, you can go all the way back to uh, the 1940s and look at the stuff that um, Ernst Meyer uh, was writing about. So he's the guy that, that is really big on, um, he invented the, well, he kind of coined the biological species concept. So he's big on reproductive isolation and how that emerges and how that creates new species. Mm. So what he said, and he was, um, he was very active in the uh, ornithological community, so he, he wrote a lot about birds. And he basically um, hypothesized that uh, subspecies formation is the second of five stages of speciation in birds. Mm. So that's so it's, it's not it's not an entirely um, novel idea, but um, like I've kind of alluded, it, it's received a lot of attention in birds. Um, so then what I did was <laughs> I kind of joked with my supervisor uh, about this. Um, we said we were going to write a paper called mammals are not birds <laughs> because i basically wanted to see whether <laughs> the patterns that we see in in birds do we see them in mammals yes or no so i i looked at um correlations between subspecies richness and species richness so all the analyses were done at the uh, genus level and i looked at the strength of the correlation between these two and so what you see in birds is that um, it's a lot higher overall uh, than what you see mm -hmm. for mammals as a whole so that to me was really weird and that's where that idea of, of that paper called um mammals are not birds uh, came from and um uh. so that's weird because that kind of goes against what you'd expect if you're maya or if you're darwin um or if you're me because i thought it, um, i was going to see um, something similar to birds so then i started right. thinking about well okay so w why are mammals not birds why are they different uh, and the obvious thing is that you know most birds fly and most mammals don't um, so then I started thinking about the relationship between subspecies, uh, ecology, and species. And so I, I did a very mm -hmm. simple test. I just separated my data set and looked at, um, do we see a stronger correlation in the things that aren't terrestrial, so the flying and the swimming mammals, um, compared with those terrestrial mammals? Um, so that, that, for me, is when the penny dropped. So that's the eureka moment, as it were, mm -hmm. because what I saw was the correlation between, these, between subspecies richness and species richness is much higher in the non-terrestrial uh, mammals. So those, again, are the, uh, the flying and the, the swimming mammals. So that, for me, was, was the moment where I thought, OK, that's actually interesting, because we've made uh, the model a little bit more complicated. We're not just saying that subspecies can turn into species, but we're saying that ecology mediates that relationship. So that, that for me, was the eureka moment. I, I, feel, I find it very funny talking about eureka moments, because I'm only me. Um, and so eureka sounds so grand, you know? So that, that <laughs> 
Um, but anyway, that's bad as the press, aren't they? Yeah. Hyping me up. Yeah. Well, all of this, of course, goes back to Charles Darwin and his work on the origin of species. I think it was in chapter three that he speculates that a large genus of animals is more likely to give rise to lots of varieties, lots of subspecies. So what you found pretty much authenticates this, wouldn't you say? Um, actually, I'm, I'm really pleased to use the word um, authenticate rather than proof. <laughs> Because in the paper, the, you know, all we do is show a, cor a positive correlation. It's not even it's not even super, super strong. It's not like, you know, uh, 0.9 or something. Um, so we do show a, a positive correlation between these things, which which um, I guess, like you say, authenticates uh, what Darwin said. Mm. Um, so he goes into detail a little bit, but he doesn't really um, he doesn't really explain why he thinks that's the case. He kind of goes into detail and says, oh, varieties, you know, could potentially form species. But it's all very... Well, if you've read, you know, literature from from that era, it's all very grand, but it doesn't actually say that much. <laughs> so it doesn't go into the mechanisms of, you know, why that why that should be the case. But yeah, um, it does go all the way back to the Darwin. You're right. Now, a lot of people are going to be wondering about human subspecies. Now, Neanderthals are sometimes referred to as a subspecies, and we know from DNA evidence that humans interbred with them. Is it possible that there are, or one day might be, human subspecies living alongside us? And when we say subspecies, we're definitely not talking about uh, race or ethnicity, because that's a totally different thing, correct? That's a, that's a big question. There's a lot to uh, unpack. I think I'll, um, <laughs> <laughs> I think I'll go for the uh, the race question first. So, do humans have subspecies? Um, and then I'll move on to the Neanderthal um, side of things. So basically, um, humans don't have subspecies. I have to be very clear about that. They just don't. Um, when you, if you remember what I what I said about um, my def oh, the definition of subspecies, um, it has to represent mm -hmm. a a unit that that is a break from the rest. Um, and what that means is that you can't have sort of in between. So say say you have two subspecies, you can't have it, you shouldn't have mm -hmm. in between uh, forms, um, and what we have in humans um, is so. If you look at if you look at you know the thing that is most often talked about skin color. If you um, if you of course there's differences in skin color. If I compared myself to someone from Bali to someone from Kenya, um, you would see differences in skin color. But if you sampled everyone or enough people, um, you would see that 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 human variation um, phenotypic variation is clinal, and what that means it's it's just a gradient um, and Imposing uh, discrete groupings on that is just, there's no um, way to do that. It's just, you know that, that clip of Ed Miliband saying, it's just wrong, it's just, it's just not right, it's just wrong. <laughs> that, it's, it's, it's that, basically. Um, yeah. It makes no sense. Um, and so, yeah, so, so it doesn't meet that criterion. And then when you look at the, um, the genetics of, of modern humans, we're incredibly similar, which is, it's very surprising given the amount of phenotypic variation. So there is a lot of phenotypic variation in modern humans. Um, but and, and I think it surprises a lot of people um, to hear things like, if you look at chimpanzee subspecies, they're more differentiated from each other than two random people from different con continents. Um, mm. Penguins have more genetic diversity than, than modern humans do. Mm. Um, so, so when you look at it genetically, again, there's no case for subspecies. Um, so, so it doesn't meet that criterion. And then you look at range, well, we, we're everywhere, and there's no real gaps between uh, human populations. And there's so much interconnectivity. So yeah, some people, you know, I'm living on an island at the moment in the UK, uh, but that island's pretty big. Um, and also there's a lot of, well, not anymore because of the lockdown, but there's a lot of <laughs> uh, connectivity, right? So we're not isolated um, like, uh, animal subspecies are um, so basically we don't meet any of the the criteria um, and actually I get that question a lot when I talk about my research about um, are human races subspecies and then I have to explain that first of all we can't make these discrete groupings uh, in modern humans we can't make these um, discrete uh, groupings anyway which means that we basically don't have subspecies and then you get the question but why don't we have these subspecies or could um, there be? Yeah, and could there be, exactly. Um, well, my answer to that is, yeah, there could be, 
if we colonized another planet because we're such an interconnected species so imagine a situation in which we colonize another planet and then don't um you know exchange genes with them for you know, um hundreds of thousands of years which would be a great topic for a book that that would lead to those um groups becoming mm. um you could classify them probably uh as subspecies if they become phenotypically distinct enough uh, from each other um yeah uh, and, for instance if they went to another world the gravity might be different and they might yeah. become tall and thin and winnowy and uh yeah they yeah. would look back at us back on earth and go oh, oh no thank you yeah yeah exactly yeah um no that's exactly right and then uh for the neanderthal uh question that's a really interesting mm. one because that's been a debate for a while and the consensus um, in the anthropology community is that um, Neanderthals and humans are two separate species. And the reason for that is, okay, yeah, we interbred uh, with them. So that sort of violates um, Maya's uh, biological species concept, which says that you're not supposed to be able to um, interbreed if you're two separate species. But I think it's more of a, not a failing of that um, definition, but a shortcoming of that definition because it doesn't well first of all it doesn't apply to to um, a lot of organisms things like plants um or bacteria or you know things that, that don't sexually reproduce but what you see in nature is lots of species um which mm -hmm. are full species still uh interbreed and hybridized so you see that in uh, baboons for example you see it in the big cats too again you know the the ligers um uh from tiger king <laughs> um <laughs> so they're all over the place um so things hybridize um and actually when you look at the the phenotypes of so what what neanderthals actually looked like th this also blows people's mind and it blows my mind too you can differentiate ear bones of neanderthals and humans um based on shape and size you can actually tell which one belongs to which species and um you know overall the morphology is very very different um so okay even if they've um you know if obviously we we did interbreed um with them but they're, they're, on, they're definitely on their way to becoming um, um, full species in the sort of biological species sense of the word. And in most other definitions of species, they would have already attained uh, species status. But it's a good question, and it's, it's, it's stumped people. Um, and people are still people's opinions are still divided on it. I mean, the, there have been, I think, subspecies when you look at, I mean, Homo erectus was around for two million odd years, like yeah. the most successful hominid. And uh, I think I'm correct in saying that we had like Homo heidel, heidelbergensis, which is mm -hmm. perhaps a subspecies, or definitely Homo ergaster, which is African. Uh, yeah. Uh, Homo yeah. erectus was a subspecies. So we did have them at one point. Yeah, and but the thing is, it's very difficult to um, to diagnose subspecies based on fossils um, because um, we don't. The main thing that people use to differentiate subspecies today is um, is what they looked like uh, on the outside. So in birds, it's a lot easier, and and the animals I mentioned before, you know, they have distinct coloration. Obviously, we don't have that for the fossils, mm. so um, it's a little bit more difficult um, to say. Um, but basically, what what what's going on in humans is. It, it's very messy um, and, and people's opinions are very divided. Uh, you know, should we have uh, many subspecies? Uh, should we have many species? Um, or was it all just one lineage or a few lineages with lots mm. of regional morphs? Um, this kind of thing. And people are very divided about it. Um, but I, I personally yeah. think... And there's a big argument that, that let's call them all Homo erectus, everything from Homo yeah. erectus onward. Let's yeah. just call them all yeah. that, you know. That's another yeah, argument. Exactly. Well, exactly. Um, and then and then you see the stuff, um, all the, the, the recent um, publications, well, like recent as in, you know, 2015, those kinds of uh, times, where you've got um, regionally, you know, in terms of the origin of modern humans, you've got very distinct um, phenotypes all across Africa that all have bits that, that lead us to say, well, they're, they're very nearly fully modern human, but not quite. Um, but they all have hmm. different bits that are um, archaic and uh, different bits that, that look more like us. Um, and to me, that, that screams um, subspecies. That screams, and, and basically, a subspecies, that, that, sorry, that um, meets the criteria for a subspecies, um, right? Because they're, they're in their own areas, they look distinct phenotypically, we don't know much about their, their genetics, but um, yeah. So, that, so yeah, I agree with you there. There will have been um, subspecies in the hominin lineage for sure. 
Well, the great thing about your work is that now it can be used by conservationists and environmentalists to predict how a species may or may not go extinct. Yeah. Um, so actually, for me, I think the real value of this, and it's something that I'm, that I, well, I was writing up before we had this interview, um, is the idea that we can use subspecies um, as an indicator of what's going to happen to a species. So it's, it's more an idea of, um, is it more or less likely that this species is going to split into subspecies and those subspecies then become full species over time? So it's more, a, more an idea of um, looking forward to see what can be created um, out of a species. And so that's important for things like, you know, the conservation of biodiversity. Are you interested in, in keeping lots of uh, future species or are you interested in, in doing it a different way? But that's, I think, how it uh, can be used. But also um, the idea that, that um, species make subspecies in different ways. Maybe that's bad phrasing, but the idea that um, the process of how subspecies are formed is different um, according to, you know, whether you're terrestrial or not terrestrial. Um, means that we can start thinking about, okay, so how will a barrier in, in uh, the landscape affect the future evolution of an endangered species? Um, because it'll do so differently for terrestrial mammals versus, you know, flying ones. Because imagine a bat can fly over a road, but maybe some kind of shrew or some kind of mouse, um, you know, they can't cross the road, so they're more likely to uh, become subdivided populations. Um, and we know the bonobos were cut off from chimpanzees. But yes, they were separated. Um, yeah. So there you go. And um, actually, that's that's a that's a good point to sort of say um, subspecies don't inevitably turn into species. And that's what makes them interesting to me. They sit at this interesting boundary between, well, there's there's a few alternatives. So a subspecies can over time become a species. And that's the sort of uh, Myrian sense of a subspecies. It can just remain a subspecies forever and ever and ever as long as the species uh, doesn't go extinct. Or it can... Um, you know, through interbreeding, join the, the bigger gene pool of the rest of the species. And that's what those tiger people are doing by illegally breeding them, is mixing these subspecies up again. So basically the point is, is that a subspecies doesn't inevitably become a species. Um, but on the other hand, all species will have been subspecies in the past. Does that make mm. sense? <laughs> yeah, it's very <laughs> it's a interesting. Bit of a, a logical conundrum. But um, in in this definition of subspecies <laughs> and, and nobody really really had figured that out before that we we're, were all subspecies at one, one point well do you know what i think uh you know people like maya um do make that point uh and i think some primate um authors have made this point as well but um because people are very wary of the it's a very unsexy uh taxonomic unit um, and what I mean by that is people are very uncertain if uh, what we call a subspecies actually represents a subspecies, you know, genetically or because if you think we haven't had um, a lot of genetic data for a lot of species for a very long time. Yeah. Um, so sort of checking whether or not we've actually named these units in the way we want to name them um, yeah. has, has made people a bit wary of using them in models. And that's so the paper that I just published has like an enormous amount of uh, behind the scenes analyses that we don't present in the actual paper, but it's all in the supplementaries. It's all checking to see um, if the definition of a subspecies is slightly different. Uh, what does that do to the correlations? Basically validating what we're concluding. So I think people have been scared of using um, subspecies in their models. And it's just that I was <laughs> not really stupid enough to just do it, but you know, kind of uh, young and, and um, irreverent enough to <laughs> To Brave try, enough. yeah, <laughs> okay, yeah, to to try uh, to see what comes out. Um, I think that's. Well, yeah. I think people don't like the word sub as well. Yeah, it's yeah. almost like you know beneath and not as good in subpar. I mean, yeah. let's call it alt species or something. Some yeah, new yeah, term yeah. Yeah. Come Sipi, around one day. I like proto species. <laughs> oh, I love then, that. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. then people might start paying more attention to it in a sort of. Uh, that's a much know. better thing. I like. That. <laughs> we'll call it that then. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, that was so, so interesting. And thank you, Laura, not only for coming on to Evolution Soup, but for the work you've done in this very important field. And if anyone wants to follow your work, I'll leave links in the description below. And hopefully we will speak again on the channel in the very near future. Well, thank you so much for, for having me on, Mark. It's been a lot of fun. <laughs>